Welcome to Is It Philosophy? For thousands of years, philosophy has been the domain of the elite, a form of thought placed on a tall pedestal. Well, not anymore. I want to take it back to its roots, simply the love of wisdom. A guest will join me each episode as we try to apply critical thinking to a new topic. At the end, it will be up to you to decide. Is it philosophy? All right, everybody, we are back again. I'm joined by Joseph Blackman. We're going to talk about the topic, is it possible for what you don't know to hurt you? Joseph, I like to, again, give everybody the option to kind of dive into this first. So what is your your first thought on it? I know you came at me with a different topic or idea, and I thought rolling it into this was a really good idea. So what are your thoughts on this? So um, and first of all, thanks for what you do, man. I think philosophy is one of those things that gets lost kind of in the, you know, the middle years of life. You know, you get out of college, you're done with philosophy class, and then you're 60 years old and you start looking at philosophy again. So I feel like you're doing a good, you're doing God's work with bringing up these good subjects, these juicy subjects, you know, for people our age in our demographic. So thanks for that, man. But so what you, what you don't know hurting you or what you do know hurting you or not hurting you. So I did a little bit of research on this. I'll preface it by saying it's not what you don't know. It's what you think you know that ain't so. And that's where, and I'll bring personal experience into it. I'll, I'll say that that's where I've been tripped up at when I thought I knew something. And that thing that I knew turned out to be incorrect. I feel like a lot of times in life, we get into a mode of getting more and more and more and more knowledge, but the knowledge that we have is usually bad information. I mean, that can come from parents, that can come from schools. I mean, think about it. Like when you're a kid, your parents probably told you, eat all your food, finish your food, you know, before you can do anything else, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I grew up and I started to educate myself on diets and stuff, I realized I don't need that many calories in a day. I don't really need to eat three square meals a day just to function. And I felt like I was gaining weight because I was eating too much and I was at a caloric surplus. And then, you know, you start gaining weight, then it's hard to, to lose it over time over the years. So that was something that I didn't know that did hurt me. But another thing is when you do know something or when you don't know something, I feel like the learning experience, it hurts you, but it also gives you another tool to move forward with in life, another tool for your tool belt or another piece of knowledge to solve that equation in the future. So it does hurt you, but it does help you in a certain regard. I believe wholeheartedly, and oddly enough, I can't remember the show, but I know that this idea kind of came to me from a, a cartoon. But the character said that, you know, something was said, and he's like, well, the only reason that's bothering you is because you know that now. And, yeah. and the, the other character is like, well, no, it's because you did this thing. And he said, well, if you didn't know it, it would have never hurt you. Yeah. I, I wholeheartedly believe that it is impossible virtually impossible for something we don't know to hurt us or to have an effect on us at all beyond like maybe f physical, like you said, where we're extra weight and things like that. I'll, I'll give you that. I'm totally on board with that. Uh -huh. But emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, the things we don't know can never hurt us. Yeah. I, I would have kind of equate it with how like, so I'm a Christian and in the Christian faith, it's kind of one of those things like if a baby dies, right? The baby automatically goes to heaven. And the reason being is because the baby didn't have a choice to not choose Christ. You get what I'm saying? I do. Like the, the baby didn't have to, a chance to say, yo, you know, I'm not, I'm cool. I'm going to just go this atheist route or I'm cool. I'm going to go the X, Y, Z route or whatever. And so the baby just, it can't make the choice. It doesn't know. So it won't affect it or him or her or whatever. But sheesh, I mean, I think of most of the the like the pain and the issues in my life, those are from things that I that I didn't know. I mean But are they from you not knowing them or are they from you finding out about them later on? So <laughs> which is a great question. It they could be they could be one and the same. Me finding about it later on through the the error or through the mishap could be an unknown or could be not knowing. But then again, like you said, it could just be me finding out later on. But I'll have to say that, especially it's 2019. I mean, we've got Google at our fingertips. It's really, I, I don't want to say there's zero excuse, but there's a low, a low amount of excuse for us to have for not knowing something. Granted, we can't know everything and that's not what life's about. I feel like when you do know everything, that that's a whole different story. But when you don't know something and you have Google to access, you know, the answer for this, the answer for that, 
that allows, I mean, these ills in life or the things that can, that, that can happen to you to hurt a little bit more because shoot, I could have just took another, you know, 20 minutes and researched this tax law, then I wouldn't have these tax problems. You get what I'm saying? Or, you know, in previous relationships, I could have read a book on relationships and then said, okay, well, when she says she hates me, I can automatically know that that means right now. And that, and it doesn't mean forever or always. Um, and then that would allow me to make a more educated decision or reaction or response after that incident. I see what you're saying, and I, I get where you're going with the the ideas of of tax laws, maybe medical things, medical conditions. If uh-huh. we don't know that we have them, they certainly are going to hurt us, right? Yeah. I want to take it a different path, and probably the the intended path, maybe that you had when you sent me this idea, which is the idea of does what happens in Vegas stay in Vegas? Uh huh. So for for me, that's that's kind of where the crux of this argument lies. Is let's say. My wife, which she would never do this, FYI, if she's listening, I know you won't. But let's say for argument's sake, my wife goes out to Las Vegas for a week for a a company trip. Yep. While she's out there, she hooks up with some random person. Yep. They do their thing for a week. She comes back. I'm none the wiser. I have no idea this this has happened, nor will I ever find out unless she tells me. Yeah. So... I'm going to continue living my life under this notion that I've got a perfect marriage, a wife who's been faithful. All of these things are still in my in my mind still there. So what she did there that I have no idea about will never have an effect on me, the way I see her, my relationship, nothing. If she were to get pregnant, unless the kid comes out way different from me, <laughs> yeah, I would never know. I would assume my kid right and that won't hurt you yeah exactly so it, it has no effect on me spirit or uh psychologically spiritually emotionally it, it never has an effect on me the only way it has an effect on me is if on her deathbed she it admits to hey 30 years ago 40 years ago this thing happened now i'm devastated yeah, yeah. but am i devastated now because i found out or am i devastated now because the thing happened and and I would have never known you know you see where I'm going with it yeah and I I think so I I read this before that like with infidelity or just any type of deceit any type of lie like we lie like when somebody lies what they're doing is they're taking they're taking the past and holding it with them all the way into the future until they until either the lie comes out or until they tell the truth so like if I lie to you and say, hey, let's just say like I lie and say, hey, I play for the 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 New York Knicks. So now you think I play for the New York Knicks. Now, every time you and I interact, I have to prove or say something that supports the lie of me playing for the New York Knicks. You get what I'm saying? So like in a situation like Vegas, if, if you don't know something that somebody else did, it won't hurt you. But that person, they have to live with it. And, and carry with it for which if, if you've if you've ever lied before, if you ever stole before, it does sit on your conscience. It doesn't make you act that much different, but it's 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 kind of like a little bit of a weight added to your day. I mean, just imagine somebody put a two and a half pound weight in your backpack, you know, while you're going to work. And then let's say a year later, they put another two and a half. Then every year they put another two and a half pound weight in your backpack. Over the years, you'll you'll start to feel like, man, I'm carrying some some certain weight. And then your partner might figure that out. And that's why the notion of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas or, or does what happened in Vegas stay in Vegas. How I think it's it's an easy, easy thing to say. It's something that the whole YOLO culture can get with. But I feel like when you do some dirt to somebody, you have to carry that with you and wear that and bring that in every interaction with that person. But like you said, you make a good point that if they don't know, then it won't hurt them. Well, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I, I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, I don't have a good enough memory to lie. I just, I don't. <laughs> it requires yeah. too much effort, too much mental capacity that I just don't contain. So it's just easier not to do it. But I, I, I wholeheartedly see where you're going with it because I, I wholeheartedly subscribe to the idea from my own Buddhist faith of karma. Uh-huh. So putting that, that dishonesty, that lie, even something as, as my, minute. Yeah has an effect on on your soul, yourself, your being, whatever it may, whatever you want to call it. And and it drags it down. It makes it heavier. That's that's why, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not real familiar with, with Christianity, but 
that's why the the soul gets dragged down to hell is because of the weight of all the dishonesty and lies and everything else. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's baggage. Yeah, so I I see that, and I see that from that standpoint. I wholeheartedly get that, and I see how the things that we don't tell other people have a tremendous effect on us. For me, it's it's the the person who we're deceiving. They they are none the wiser. They will never know. It never affects them. The the thing you said at the top of the the show though that I really liked was the idea of the things you thought you knew had the most effect on you. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that is probably one of the biggest problems we have as a, as humans. I forget, I forget what it's called, but there's a, a Japanese philosophy. So let, let me start with this. So most people will overestimate the things they know. Most people, there was a psychological study done. The vast majority of people will overestimate the amount of knowledge they have. Totally. Well, there, there was a Japanese study done that, showed that people who have a plethora of books, just a a ton of books, actually have the opposite effect. They underestimate the amount of stuff they know. Mm. And and there's a theory or a, a Japanese concept. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Maybe somebody can help me out later. But that, that states that what that is, is all those books that you will probably never get to all represent something that you don't know. Yeah. So the more books you have in your home library, the more you realize there is so much out there. I don't know. So I, I, I totally get what you're saying. And that's, that's it's some type of bias. And I've read about it before, but I forgot what it was called. But it's about the people who, who think they're educated or the people are so dumb that they think they know everything or something like that, <laughs> but, which, which is subjective. But I wanted to kind of get into the internet age knowing everything in this it's called confirmation bias. So for instance, me and my buddy used to argue that I would always say that germs make somebody sick. And he would say that, no, the cold weather makes one sick. And then we would actually pull out our phones and Google. Uh, I would Google, do germs make one sick? And they, and you find 10 articles that say yes. And then he'll he'll Google, does the cold weather make someone sick? And he'll find 10 articles that say yes. So we both got 10 different sources that support our arguments. So at the end of the day, we both feel like we know, but do we really, really know? I think we're heading down a path of, can we really ever know anything? Uh Uh-huh. If we can really know everything, I feel like it's our duty to go out and search for that knowledge. That will be our way of accepting responsibility and being penalized for not knowing. But if we can't know everything, then yes, what we don't know should not hurt us because we don't know. And then what you don't know, what you you don't know what you don't know. And you don't know what to look for if you don't know what to look for. I don't know the philosopher off the top of my head, but there's there's a philosopher that wholeheartedly subscribes to the idea of you can't know something because the world around us is not real, essentially, because you're seeing it through the bias of your own eyes and your own eyes and your own ears. And all of these things have filters and are run through this process of your past and your biases and your prejudices and all of those things. So in essence, what what he's saying, and again, I wish I knew who it was, but what he's saying is it's impossible for us to actually know anything because yeah. all of the world around us is just an image or an illusion fit to our personal bias. And what you're, what you're defining is called seeker's bias. So for instance, you drop a quarter on your couch, right? Let's say you got a leather couch, you drop a quarter on the couch. Every time you try to go and get that quarter out of the, out of the, the corner of the couch, like between the, where the bottom cushion and the, and the, and the top cushion meet, you know, you make that little space and the quarter slides farther and further back. And then you reach again and the quarter slides back into the couch where you can't even reach it anymore. That's called seeker's bias. We get in our own way of finding the true answers, like you said, through our biases, through our past experiences, through how we were raised, through, uh, you know, through our social upbringing. So, yeah, you're totally right. I, I feel like we won't know everything because we don't know everything. So then that leads to my question of to to answer the question between you and your friend, which one of you is right? If you <laughs> both can confirm your argument with, hey, here's 10 things that prove I'm right. Which one of you is right? But you both can't be right, right? You can't both be right. Something can't be both true and false. So one of you has got to be right. That That's correct. 
I, one of us has to be right. I think in a situation like that, there's kind of a marriage between the two. If we're asking, can two people be right with opposing views? It's like the whole liberal versus conservative thing. We're both right. Everybody feels like they're right. But at the end of the day, who is really right? So if if we're making a decision today, like climate change, if we're making a decision today for 30 years down the road, it's kind of hard to prove out who's right right now. And how does one prove out or how does one objectively state who's right if you know that answer isn't going to come to fruition for another 20, 30 years? That's a that's a good point. And I think that's the one of the big arguments of something we don't know that could potentially cause us severe har- harm. Yeah. Right. We don't we don't know for certain climate change is a thing. There's been study after study that have shown that the earth is in a constant flux of hot and cold and, and is always changing. Whether humans are there or not, it's, this has always been the case. And there's articles, just thousands of articles on each side would support each stance. Sure. Which, you know, makes both of us right. But I mean, and then again, what is, so let's say we're both right. Who loses if we're both right? And is there a marriage if, we're, I'm not asking about climate change, just in general. If you and I are both right, is there a detriment to both of us being right? Are you being right and me being right? Or is there more of a detriment for both of us being wrong? There again, I came back. I'm reading a couple of really good philosophy books right now. And and there's, uh, again, I can't think of the guy's name, but there's there's the argument made by a, a current philosopher. I say current, probably in the last 300 years <laughs> yeah. on the idea of it makes more sense to believe in a God than to not believe in a God. Because if you're right, you get this eternal reward, this eternal bliss. And what did but it if cost you're wrong, you? exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. his argument. You the didn't lose anything. Yeah. And that's why I, so, and I'm the type of guy I like to argue with atheists all the time. And it's like, right, I'm a Christian, but I, I respect all religions, but I just happen to be raised in, the Christian, in a Christian household and it makes sense to me and it still does. So when people say, oh, Christians are bad, every every war was started because of Christians, you know, blah, 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 blah. I always say, okay, let's say you have a newborn baby, right? Just just like yourself, you call it karma. We call it the law of reciprocity. If I sow an apple seed into the ground, I'm going to not get an orange tree, not get a grape tree, not get a banana tree. I'm going to get an apple tree. Uh, same with you. Like You believe that whatever you put into the universe, it comes back to you. So I say that who would you rather have babysit your newborn, an atheist or a Christian? Or let's say an atheist or someone that does believe in God. And they go, well, Christians are violent. Christians judge. You know, Christians started all these wars and Christians are greedy and Christians, you know, they're all, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I say, well, what does the atheist stand for? And they go, oh, and they they have the answers. But I say, wouldn't you want someone who who knows deep down inside that if they do something wrong, something wrong is going to happen to them versus somebody who feels like there is no type of um like it's everything's free will and like there's you could do what you want and nothing happens to you on the, on the back end of it so i i get that argument but i'm going to throw something at you uh-huh. that i think is is interesting so i i know several atheists in my life and the vast majority of them that i know are the most caring giving work for the most amount of charities of anybody that i know christian or not and so i don't i don't know that Having that knowledge that your work here on earth is going to give you a eternal reward necessarily makes somebody better or worse. I think it's it's the individual. Like I said, I've got a friend of mine, a friend of the family's, complete atheist. He thinks the moment you die, you go in the dirt, nothing happens. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He works for Make-A-Wish. He works for a ton of charities in the area. He does wrestling events where he donates all of the profits to make a wish. She takes kids out for their, their make a wish stuff. My wife, atheist, she will be the first person to give you the shirt off her back. Or if you need a dollar for food or do $200 to pay your car payment, she's the first one coming to me going, Hey, we, we need to help this person out. They're, they're suffering. And I'm, I'm standing there going, even with my idea on karma going, eh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe we, we see what happens. So to both of you guys, the atheist and, and the Christian, have a firm belief they are right. Yeah. Does knowing you're right make you a, a better or worse person? And having this belief that what I think is the way it is 
does knowing you're right does knowing you're right make you a good or, or a bad person so whenever i approach things I, I go into it with a beginner's mindset a mindset as if i don't know anything about it what does seneca say that the the person that asks a question looks like a fool for a second you know he's a genius for the rest of his life and the person that doesn't ask the question is just an idiot for the rest of his life so i feel like if we do go into situations, if we do feel like we know everything, even like with my, you know, convictions on faith or politics or uh, uh, my, my, you know, I guess money or social status, any of that stuff. If I go into everything as if I know everything, then that's at a detriment to me because that means I'm blocked off. Uh, what does Buddha say? Or mind like water, like be a river where you can take in information and you can spit out information. Don't be a lake or a puddle to where, you know, information doesn't move in nor out and you start to atrophy. Yeah, I, I can see that. I, and I agree with that. And so an, another thing when it comes to, to not knowing about things. So um, there's a huge, there's, there's a huge push on mental health illnesses, right? Which is great. I feel like these are the things, especially I'm, I'm a black guy. In my culture, we don't really speak on mental health. It's not that big of a, of something that my culture puts on the forefront. It's kind of like hidden. It's kind of like, you know, just be a man, stand up. You know, if, you, if you're depressed, you're soft. If you have anxiety, like there's something wrong with you, like figure it out. And so, and, and I'm, right now I'm reading a book on anxiety and depression. And just to learn more about it, I don't really feel like I've had issues with depression, but there's certain situations where I feel like, you know, anxiety can kind of go, whoa, like, hey, Joseph, like, this is a new situation for you. I'm going to make you sweat. You know, I'm going to make your throat dry up real quick. And I'm, you know, I'm going to do certain things to let you know that, like, this is a new atmosphere for you. But when anxiety is, I guess the, the definition of it is worrying about the future or, or worrying about the unknown aspect about the future. And, and that kind of goes back into our topic of not what you don't know potentially does not hurt you. Like, if we could explain to everybody that, hey, you're worrying about something that hasn't happened and you're adding, you know, you're adding stress or you're adding, you know, turmoil to something that hasn't even came to pass yet. And honestly, if, even if you don't know or don't handle the situation right, it won't hurt you. I feel like that will liberate a lot of people who deal with anxiety. I agree. No, no. And, and actually, that's something I've talked to my wife about a lot is this idea of living in the now, living in the moment, mm -hmm. because she will stress and stress and stress and, and cause herself severe problems worrying about what happened at work today and then how that's going to affect her work tomorrow. And and she always looks at me and goes, how do you not stress about this stuff? <laughs> I'm like, because it's done. What happened at work today is done. It has no effect on me sitting on this couch right now watching this movie with you at home. It has zero effect on that. And what's going to happen tomorrow at work has no effect on me now because it hasn't happened yet. Exactly. My whole life is lived right now in this exact moment. Uh -huh. And this moment never ends. It's amazing. And I've tried and tried and tried to explain that to her. And, and she just, she can't wrap her mind around it. I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand, which I don't, I mean, I guess I get some people that's a really hard mindset to take, but I mean, to, I guess to combat that play devil's advocate. So if we did live every moment for the present, we wouldn't really have our future set up to how we want it to be. Meaning that the, the yellow, the yellow culture, you know, you only live once, you know, live for the moment. Uh, my, my coach in, in college used to say, play in the present. Like I was, if I played defense, so if I got beat for a touchdown, normally, you know, the average guy will hang his head and then the offensive guy would know, Hey, go right back at that guy because he's in the dumps. His mind isn't mentally into it. So like go back at him because he's probably going to screw up again. Uh, so you have to play in the present. You get beat for a touchdown. You got to shake it off and go, hey, all right, we got we got to line back up again. Let's get back into it. But if you don't use those experiences to go, OK, well, she, he beat me on a double move last time. So next time he tries a double move, I'm going to approach it in a different way. That helps it helps set me up for the future. So I would say there's two different schools of thought. Of course, you want to plan for the future, but you got to play in the present. I think you're right. I think the, the thing is, though, is you got to. Learn from the past, but not live in the past, mm. I think is, is yeah. the key. Yeah. So, and, and the other thing is, too, the idea of setting yourself up for the future by today. The future is an unknown. The future will always be an unknown. I, I could have a job that has supported me for 30 years, given me a great 401k, supported my family, done all of those things. And I could go in tomorrow. Yeah. And they shut down and I lose my 401k and I lose everything. 
I wholeheartedly agree. Pre- prepare for the future. I'm not telling anybody out there, don't prepare for the future. Live in the moment. Spend all of your money today. <laughs> not saying that. Don't come back at me if you do that, F- FYI. But what I am saying, though, is it's the idea of hedonism, right? I, I do just subscribe to that to an extent uh. where – you know, live in your live your life for those moments of pleasure and, and those moments that give you, I guess, pleasure is the wrong word. Live your life for those moments of, of peace, regardless. And, and even if you do know something that's causing you pain, let it go. It's in the past. Yeah. I'm a huge dork and I'm going to throw it out there. But the quote from The Lion King where Rafiki hits him with the stick. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, why did you do that? Doesn't matter. It's in the past. Mm. I love that for its simplicity it's in the past it still hurts it's still going to be painful but it's in the past let it go and same thing with the things we don't know if we live our life stressed about all of the things in this world that i don't know and and how they're going to affect me and how they're going to the cause me stress and harm and anxiety and and what's going to kill me is this box of donuts that i'm eating today going to be the thing that kills me <laughs> i hope not man. i love donuts, I, I hope man. not too but it, if i go out eating a box of donuts you know i went out <laughs> amen <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. but th- that's my thing is so what there is a 100% chance you are not going to make it out of this world alive uh, 100% man you sure 100 i'm <laughs> last i heard does they change something <laughs> You're that was right. actually a topic from last season. If we load our minds to the internet, can we live forever? I think that's coming. Mm. I'm, I don't want to dive too deep into that thought yet, but uh, we are all going to die. So live your life for the peaceful moments you can have today and forget the things you don't know and forget the things that have maybe harmed you in the past that you do know that aren't affecting you now. Yeah. I think that's the the ultimate and the most beautiful way to live. What would you say is like a version for you that's a rewind button or like a pause or reset button? I don't like say like quarterbacks say, oh, I wish I had that ball on a string because they threw it and it was a bad throw and then, you know, it was an interception. What for you, I guess, in your day to day or in your life is is a way for you to hit rewind on something? The only way. okay, I see what you're saying. So for me, the the best way for that is is my nightly meditation where I, I. go through my day and and I actually started doing this because of anger issues mm. where I, I would go through my day and go, man, I would have loved to have responded to this situation differently and maybe not in anger. So I'll, I'll replay it in my mind. Okay. So yeah. And yeah. So for me, that's been my, my saving grace. And that's actually been one of the strongest things to kind of, I don't want to say fix, but help me with my anger. So I'm the same way. And I'm glad you said that. So if I do something is like a so a, a awkward social interaction or I you know said something wrong or did something wrong or rubbed somebody the wrong way, I go, okay, I screw that up. Like what was I going through at the time that that made me do that? You know, what was I feeling like? What uh what led me like what form of stimuli put me in the position to do that to that person or say that or or anything? And and then I go, okay, how can I not replicate that? And then kind of like reverse engineer the whole deal. Like, was I late to the appointment? You know, was I wearing uncomfortable shoes? You know, did I only have four hours of sleep the night before? Like, how can I not have those series of, of events happen again to replicate that situation? That's kind of a way for me to rewind it and say, okay, I screwed up. Let me go back. Let me let me try to redo it. So what you're saying is you're you're learning from the things that you do know. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. That's a That's a great way to go about it. What is then your final thought on this? Is it possible for the things that we don't know to hurt us? Or are we immune from the things that we don't know? So I think on a micro, we do get hurt by the things we do, we don't know. But on a macro, I believe it's kind of the whole, yeah, what you, what you don't know doesn't hurt you. Because if we learn from it, it actually helps us out. So I'm going to say on a micro level, on a small scale level, like on a petty level yes it does hurt us but on a on the, on the grand scheme of things which is kind of what life needs to be lived like at a 30,000 30, foot view um it, it doesn't hurt us what are your thoughts i think there's a i can't think of the megadeth song but there's a megadeth song that says life can only be understood in reverse and i think for all of us that holds true we can't stress over things that we know or don't know and how they've affected us or didn't affect us in the end on your deathbed looking back, it'll all make sense. Mm. And all of the things you knew and didn't know will come to light and you'll go, that's why that wasn't known until I was 52. Yeah. Or that's why I didn't learn that until 
my kids did that or until, you know, it, all of those things will go, ah, they click. And that's one thing I learned throughout reading all these books is that everything you learn or read, like every book is just in time. Meaning the person you were two years ago when you read a book on Plato or, or whatever, when you took in a piece of information, that was just in time for you. If you read that two years before, you know, four years ago, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have sunk in for you. Like that's why they say reread books. Don't be afraid of rereading the top 20 books for the rest of your life instead of reading 500 books, which I have an issue with. I feel like I need to reread more instead of just reading new book after new book after new book. No, I'm the same way when it comes to books. I've got a massive library in my house (laughs) and a lot of them I haven't read because they're just, I'm a collector. I, I take that idea, the Japanese idea to heart and yeah. all of these books. And my wife got onto me a few weeks ago about it. And she's like, you know, why do you need so many books? We, we were getting three and four orders a week from Amazon. <laughs> so you don't need all of these. I'm like, yes, I do. Yeah. They all, they all represent something. They do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she, she, she doesn't get, she kind of gets it. I have, she kind of laid off a little bit. And then once you get to the point, you can use them as references. Like if you're if you're thinking of X, Y, or Z, you can go back into a book that, that was kind of in that same lane of what you're dealing with. And then you start to read through it and then, okay, boom, we found your answer for that certain issue or that subject. Oh, yeah. And that, that's why I wholeheartedly subscribe to the idea of what we don't know can't hurt us. Because if I didn't have that book and I didn't have that knowledge... I wouldn't know that that thing that I didn't know or that issue that was coming up in my life or whatever it was that was presenting itself was going to be detrimental because I didn't have that knowledge. But that's also why I've got a massive library of books. <laughs> like you said, I want to know it all, damn it. I want to know it all now. <laughs> we got to, man. <laughs> you got to know it yesterday. Exactly. Well, so I want to thank you for, for having this conversation quite fascinating. And I also want to give you a chance to, I don't know if you've got a, a podcast or a blog or anything where people can get a hold of you, but I want to give you that chance to, to share that with everybody and let them know how they can reach you. Um, my main, I guess, hub is just Instagram at Joseph Blackman number six. And uh, on the Instagram, you'll see what I do is I read books and then I post my takeaways from each and every book that I read. Just so other people who might not have the time, might not want to read a book, might not even think about trying to read a book in a certain lane that I'm reading, they can glean from it. I mean, I'm all about taking on information just so I could pass it on to somebody. And so you'll see that on my Instagram. Then I got a blog where I post more book stuff and I post little articles on what I'm thinking, just pretty much rants. Um, but yeah, at Joseph Blackman six, that's where I'm at. Well, again, thank you for, for joining me. I, I hopefully, if nothing else, we have given everybody a new take or a new way of approaching this idea and, and they will come reach out to one of us and, and argue their side of it. Cause I I'm wholeheartedly for that. If oh, not yeah. him, definitely reach out to me. Yeah. Reach out. Let's get it going. Let's learn again. Thanks for joining me. And I will talk to you guys all again soon. Okay, so there it is. Is It Philosophy? Go to our website at www.isitphilosophy.com and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter and Facebook as well. Help us grow by going onto iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts and subscribe. And take a moment and leave a review. Until next time, question everything, seek your truth, and don't be afraid to speak your truth. Music